It's my pleasure to welcome you to Answers from Scripture. Whether you're just being introduced to the Bible for the first time or you've been studying it for a lifetime, I'm confident that you'll benefit from Brother Mark's passionate explanations for the Word of God. Hey, I'm Brother Mark, and I'm so enthused about this opportunity to share my love of the Word of God for you and to try to answer some questions that people have from the Scriptures. And one question we want to see today, and people ask, if the Bible mentions the mythological creature, the unicorn, why shouldn't we just assume the whole book is mythology? And I'm sure you've heard that question because it seems that the people that are prone towards atheism and agnosticism, they just repeat the same few questions all the time. And that's one I've heard over and over again. If the Bible is true, if there's veracity in the scriptures, why does it mention this mythological creature? And as soon as they mention the unicorn, people have pictures of in their mind of maybe a white pony with a rainbow-colored spiral-shaped horn coming out of the middle of its head, and they, they can't believe that the Bible talks about it. Well, the Bible does talk about it. In fact, the unicorn is mentioned nine times in the Bible, but not as a mythological creature. You see, there the word for unicorn is simply the word one-horned. And any animal that had one horn was properly known as a unicorn. But there was one animal especially that's been known as the unicorn historically, and that animal is the one-horned rhinoceros. So I want to explain a couple things to you here to give us the background for answering the question. But as languages develop, there's something called semantical drift. Semantical drift just shows how the meaning of a word can gradually change, sometimes even rapidly change, from one idea to another. That what the modern-day hearer assumes you mean when you use the word might be very different from what the speaker of 400, 500, 600 years ago meant when he used the word. So you get into the study of etymology and the history of words and the meaning of words, and especially this idea of semantical drift. Does the word mean today, how the way we commonly use it today, or does the word mean something different? And what happens is if you take today's understanding of unicorn and you picture this pretty little pony with a colorful horn, uh, that is mythological, but that assumption would be what we call an anachronism. It's anachronistic. Well, what do you mean anachronistic? Well, there's a chronology to follow, the chronology of the usage of a word. And to take today's modern usage of the word and force it onto the Bible, which was translated 400 plus years ago, is an anachronism. I woke up this morning and as is so often the case, I had a crazy dream. My dreams tend to be crazy. And in my dream this morning, I was moving from Europe to America. Now, I live in Asia right now, but there was a time when I lived in Europe, and there was a time when I lived in America. And, and in my dream, I was in that stage of life, and we were packing a truck to take some things to put them into storage to move from Europe to America. But in the dream, I asked my oldest son to drive the truck so that I could get my morning Bible reading done while he was driving. And the morning Bible reading that I was all concerned about getting done was what I was supposed to read this morning, some 13 years later. And that's what you call an anachronistic confusion, where two things from two separate time periods get thrown together. That happens a lot in dreams, but it shouldn't happen in books. If it happens in books, there's a problem. And what people are doing when they ask this question, in a very superficial way, they're taking the word as they understand it today, the unicorn, oh, that's a mythological creature, and they're trying to apply it to the Bible, when in Bible days, the unicorn was simply a one-horned rhinoceros. Now, let's look at the Bible. Let's look at one instance in Job, for example, when it's talking about the unicorn, Job 39, and God's asking Job these questions in verse 9. Will the unicorn be willing to serve thee or abide by thy crib? Canst thou bind the unicorn with his band in the furrow or will he harrow the valleys after thee? Wilt thou trust him 
because his strength is great. Or wilt thou leave thy labor to him? Wilt thou believe him that he will bring home thy seed and gather it into thy barn? Now you take the animal uh, the size of a pony with a little horn in the middle. And why wouldn't we train them to bring in the seed? What, what, when in history haven't we used mules and donkeys and horses? And this mythological creature isn't all that much different. It wouldn't be so much stronger that we would fear it and that we wouldn't be willing to use it. But now take the one-horned rhinoceros. I have not met very many farmers that were going to use the one-horned rhinoceros to bring in their seed. I think there'd be times we'd be more afraid of the animal than the animal would be of us. And when the Bible describes this unicorn, it describes it as that type of animal. Remember, the word unicorn simply means one-horned. Now, when I was young, and that was a long time ago, but when I was young, I read a book called The Death of the Last Unicorn. The Death of the Last Unicorn. I think the book, um, I think that it was from India or something like that, and don't quote me on it because my memory's not the greatest, but this person believed that the last one-horned rhinoceros had been killed. They found the remains, and they had been uh, on the endangered species list, and their horns were being, they were hunted for their horns, people were taking the horns as a souvenir, and for whatever quality that they could get from them. And this person that wrote the article I read many, many years ago, believed it was the last one-horned rhinoceros on the planet and called it a unicorn, the death of the last unicorn. Well, as is often the case with scientists, this lady was wrong because in Nepal, there was still a group of about 100 unicorns, about 100 one-horned rhinoceroses, and they started to multiply. And to this very day, the day and age in which we live, there are now thousands of one-horned rhinoceroses, and you know what scientists call them today? Unicorns. Here's a book. I wrote down the title because scientists give such long titles, and I wanted to remember it. Book written in 2016, The Return of the Unicorns, The Natural History and Conservation of the Greater One-Horned Rhinoceros. Now, uh, atheist. If this book refers to that mythological creature of the unicorn, why shouldn't we just disregard the whole book as mythology? No, this is science. Scientists use the same word because it's using the word the way that it was commonly used through the centuries and not the modern usage of it that is very, very recent. And what I want to show in answering this question, and I'm almost done, but I want to show how quickly people reject the Word of God. Here's a book like none other. The Word of God is, is more reliable historically. It's more reliable archaeologically. It's more reliable in, even in its prophecy. The book is an amazing book in its, in its efficacy, which means the way it, it's used practically. There's no book that's changed lives for the better like the Word of God. And people are so willing to disregard it based on one little question that they read on the site of some atheist that really wasn't being very intellectually honest. How dismissive they are to take a book of this import and of this magnitude and to disregard it because of one question like this about the unicorn, which they misinterpret to think of this mythological creature when even scientists to this day recognize thousands, I have friends that have seen with their own eyes unicorns living today. The Bible is true. Every word of it is true. You can count on it. And don't get nervous when you read some of these dismissive little questions and statements written by atheists around the world. You have a great week. God bless you. Thanks so much for listening. If you have a question you'd like to have answered, mention it in the comments field below or visit us at www.answersfromscripture.online.